So let's go over this for uh, this one question where it says, am I close to the end of my life with, uh, that one, you know, am I close to the end of my life with COPD that's requiring me to have supplemental oxygen? So first off, no. Okay, let's make it very transparent, uh, very obvious. No, you're not the end of your life. It's just your body now is requiring oxygen. Okay, but it doesn't mean it's the end of your life. What that means is that your body is actually communicating with you in a different way, basically asking you to, you know, either breathe in deeper or, you know, get more surface area in those lungs. So, like, if you really think about it, uh, if I draw up a lung right now, so I'm going to draw up a lung, okay? We're talking about, remember what the question is. The question is, am I closer to the end of my life when I have COPD and it's also requiring me to be on oxygen? So let's say somebody is breathing shallow. Let's just pretend. Somebody's breathing shallow. Okay, sorry, I don't need to. Somebody's breathing shallow and the shallow breath is accumulating to, let's say, their vital capacity, which should be around, uh, let's say, 3,800 milliliters. But this person is only has a vital capacity or the amount of air that person can breathe in, that's what the vital capacity is. So the vital capacity for the current for this person is only at 500 milliliters, okay? Because the person is breathing shallow. They try to take a deep breath, but the muscles in between the ribs on the lower part of the lungs, these lower intercostal muscles uh, are, might not be strong enough to open up the lungs, meaning that you take a deep breath, but you don't have the strength to open up the lungs all the way. So it's only contributing to 500 milliliters of air. Uh, so the deposition of oxygen going into the blood and, and vice versa. So let's say that the disease, that the person requires supplemental oxygen, accounts for, let's say, 20% FEV1 slash force vital capacity, meaning the person has 20% lung functions. So the top part of the, or what we call the apex of the lungs, are only bringing in oxygen at, you know, 500 milliliters, but only 20% those lungs are functional, bring it in four to 6%. Meaning like right now, if I breathe in oxygen or I breathe in air, <sighs> Four to six percent makes it in to my blood. You can look at that as let's say you see somebody vaping or somebody smoking a cigarette. You see the when they smoke a cigarette, the smoke enters their uh, their body, and then as soon as the exhale comes out, okay, because only four to six percent of that smoke actually made it into the blood. Okay, that's the same thing with air. So it's only four to six percent. Whether you do it fast or slow, it's still four to six percent. Now, if the lungs were functional at 80%, 4 to 6% would be coming in, and that person wouldn't need any supplemental oxygen, let's say, okay? But because the lungs are damaged, and now they're only 20% functional, so it's not going to be 4 to 6%, it's probably going to be like 1.3% coming in. And because of that deficit, because of that problem, that person needs supplemental oxygen to compensate. So what do we have to do to fix this problem for this person? This patient is breathing shallow. If we can increase volume, let's say they can get to at least 2,500 milliliters on their incentive spirometer, that means that the areas that we have to strengthen up, these areas have to be also contributing, meaning that once I strengthen up these intercostals and that big diaphragm up, I should be able to bring in more air and if these are not as damaged as the ones on the top, which is true, if the, the, the ones in the middle or the or like one third of the lung, let's say part of it is not damaged through all the exposure of smoke inhalation, pollution, household cleaners, dust, pollen, fungi, whatever you want, you know, then these are obviously 80% functional. Meaning if we can make that person breathe more dominantly, breathing in deeper dominantly, then we won't have that problem meaning that person that's on supplemental oxygen will come off of oxygen. Why is that? Because we increase the surface area of the lungs. Look, it's not rocket science, everybody. If you breathe in shallow, you only get a little bit of oxygen in. 
If you breathe in deeper, you get more in. Okay, so if these are not, let's say the top ones are not functional as much because according to the pulmonary function test, they're only 20% functional, then we would have to increase our volume to come off oxygen and decrease our work of breathing. Okay, so the question again was, am I close to the end of my life when my COPD is requiring me to be on oxygen? This is one of the most crucial parts of your life. You either can take, you can either um, just keep waiting until it gets worse and worse and then you wind up in the hospital, you know, nonstop, or you can do something about it. So doing something about it, if you just want to go into a gym, well, that's not going to work because that's going to work out your, you know, your legs, maybe your arms, but that's not going to work the inside of your body like intercostal and diaphragmatic muscles. Okay, so when somebody goes into a gym, it's almost pointless in a say. I, I wouldn't want to say it's completely pointless, but when somebody goes in a gym and they're not working on their respiratory side, you know, they're breathing with the exercise, sure, but they're just constantly breathing shallow. Okay, so their body, may, maybe during the exercise, needs, let's say, the VQ as to the, how much oxygen is necessarily needed in that body during exercise, called a VQ. So, and we can look at it as an RPE, rate of perceived exertion, but it's best if it's looked at in a different way, meaning like if it's, um, you know, if somebody's breathing shallow, all we have to do on our end is first increase our surface area in our lungs. Now, in the program, like I said, going into a gym might not be the best thing to do, but going into a program that's certified like us okay, that has a very high success rate, because if you take, let's say you take five, you, let's say you take 10 facilities around you, let's pretend that exists, which I'm sure it does not. But let's say you have 10 facilities, you have 10 facilities around you, and then you look at what their outcomes are and what their hospital readmission rates are. Those are the two things you always wanna look at. You wanna, like when you go into a facility, you wanna ask them, it's like, how well are your outcomes? When patients come in, how well do they progress? How well, how do they, how well do they do? And can you show me data, you know, or show me evidence, which is data, based off of those, okay? Look at expectations, look at other things. So I go, let's say I go into a facility and I, and I ask them, what are your outcomes? Like, oh, they're really good. Well, that's not, that's kind of vague. That doesn't make any sense to me. Very good means what? It's very subjective. I said, can you quantify it? Can you show me a study paper that you've guys done that shows your outcomes? Okay, and let's say a facility does not have that. Well, then it might not be a great facility to go to because they should be doing studies to determine and show their patients of how well they can do the job. Okay, out of 10 facilities you'll find, you'll find only one is better than everybody else. Okay, it's always going to be like that. They're never going to be identical. Okay, when you go into a facility, you know, sometimes it can be a hit and miss where you go in and you feel the same way as you go in as you go out. It could be the same type of situation. You don't want that to happen. You know, you don't want to go in and you, you know, you spent all this time, you took all this time out, and then you go in, you, you spend 90 days, you know, in an outpatient facility. You spend 90 days inside this facility doing this therapy and you barely got a lot out of it. That's not something you want. You want to be able to go into a facility or like participate in a program like pulmonary and cardiac rehab and actually benefit from it where the person first is walking five to 10 feet when they first started and that's the, all they can do. And after 90 days, then they're up to one or two to three miles.